Is it time for a story? Oh my god. Technology scared me. I actually thought maybe I'd become a social worker or a librarian. In Southern Connecticut State College had opportunities to make me better at being those two things. And librarian to me was somebody who learned how to figure things out. And so I did decide to enroll in the library science program. And my first day in the library science program, they had an orientation meeting in Bewley Library, the fourth floor. And the fourth floor had things that I had never seen before. Now, yeah, if you look at my hair, you can see that there's a little bit of aging that has happened. So I'm not the same age as maybe some of you listening. And in that room, there was a tape deck, at least that's what I determined it was later, that was about half the size of me. Um, and it was like, oh my God, I'm supposed to learn how to use that. And there were other things that were called CD players, and I had no idea what a CD mm -hmm. was. And there were things with a lot of buttons, buttons, and buttons that I had to actually like take off my glasses to be able to read some of the little inscriptions on the side. And what does a power button do? I literally was in that room wandering around looking at this like stuff that's really dinosaurs for today or what we would consider like really historic technology and started to feel my heart beating through my chest. I became so anxious that I walked into that room weighing 114 pounds and I left weighing 108. I literally started perspiring. It, it was running down my back. I was so incredibly anxious. I was literally having a anxiety attack for the first time in my life. And then I realized that this stuff was scaring me so much that it was going to be the most expensive decision of my life to withdraw from library science master's program at Southern because I literally could not foresee pushing those buttons and having an idea how to, to use them and going into those little booths that had headphones on them. It was absolutely terrifying. So I dropped out. It was very expensive. I eventually got a job with a insurance company and I got picked to work on a special project. They called it Care Online. And this vice president had tapped me and he said, um, I really need somebody to work on this project. And it turns out that you have a master's in research and statistics now. And um, it says you've had programming. And I didn't tell him that my dissertation was qualitative analysis versus quantitative because I couldn't figure out a lot of the quantitative stuff. And even though I learned a little bit about the T square is that? What is that T thing anyway? Um, somebody in the audience probably could tell me better. But I was not really totally getting it. But I had got the qualitative stuff, the storytelling aspects of data. Um, and I fumbled with that as well. Went down to the Yale Computer Center another big room with lots of things no buttons just these big tin can kinds of things around the room and i had my little deck of cards and i would go in and in those days you didn't type into your computer you put this deck of cards and you had to figure out which button to push to make it be a reader and i got that down and i was getting my data read and i went down a couple of times and it wasn't quite right the last time I go down with my deck of data, just before the thesis is supposed to be written, I needed one more section of analysis, and I had 278 cards to be read. And it was a rainy day, something like today, which didn't encourage many of you to get out here and listen to this story. You're going to have to hear it on TV. Um, I dropped that deck of cards. 
yeah, that, oh, damn it, I was losing weight again. Anxiety, am I gonna be able to finish this thesis in time? Technology got me like into that state of panic one more time. Come on in and sit in a chair. So there I was um, having this real phobia for technology. And so when I turned 50, I said to myself, um, oh, there is a backtracking I'm going to do here in this story to that vice president who asked me to work on Care Online. He took a phone call, and it wasn't the kind of phone call you'd take today. He basically was buzzed on something on his hip, and he had to be called away. And he left me there, and he said, okay, run it. And I'm sitting there with a basic program code in front of me on this little computer that he was working on something at home. And he said, run it. And I had no idea what he meant. And again, that stillness, that palpitation, that anxiety overcame me. This time I didn't sweat, I just became extremely still, like holding my breath, waiting for an answer to come out of the air. And he comes back and he says, did you run it yet? And then over my shoulder, he just pushes the enter button and there it goes. And I'm like, holy shit, that's all I needed to do. An enter button. And none of this would have occurred, none of this panic, none of this stillness would have overcome me if I just knew to push the enter button. So what I knew from these three experiences is that I had something to overcome. I definitely had a fear of technology. How could that be? <laughs> I'm here seven days a week running a tech organization um, that has all kinds of tech challenges. There's cameras and editing, and I've got to train people. How did I get to this place? I'm not quite sure, but because I lost so much money that first time because of the library science program, I was very interested in my corporate employer paying for me to overcome this fear. So I had an opportunity to get free tuition to go to Quinnipiac in the e-media program. And there I was able to excel. I thought I was doing good, but they gave every, nobody got a C in anything. Mm. You know, if you were doing badly, you got a B minus, but pretty much everybody was treated like they were doing really well. And I assumed I was, and you know, maybe I was. But right after I graduate, I see this little thing online and it says, how tech savvy are you? Take this quiz and see just how tech savvy you are. And I fill it all out and I'm thinking, ah, oh, at least I should make a reasonable good score on this now that I've overcome and I've got this degree in media, uh, e-media, electronic media. And it came back scoring like an old person who had never seen a computer before. <laughs> <laughs> and I got still again. But I'm here every day to serve you, hoping that media and technology can make a difference in all of our lives. Yay. If I can do it, folks, so can you. Best clip yet. This is time for expanding questions where people who have heard the story might have something that they've heard that they want to know a tiny bit more about. Could you expand a little bit on what your thesis was? That requires me not to have dementia. <laughs> <laughs> I do recall that it was qualitative, and it, actually it was about veterans. Um, it was about veterans' use of college resources after they came back from Vietnam. And the potential of creating a social gathering place for them uh, because they felt, did they feel alienated from the community of students enough because of their age differences and their maturity mm -hmm. that they needed a separate space. 
and there were, was a um, willingness on the part of Jack Mordante, who actually might still be at Southern uh, some 40 years now, to experiment with the space. So I was able to do a survey with those that were actively using the space and those that did not, and um, proved that um, creating veteran spaces in, in colleges would serve uh, the community as a whole. Any other expanding questions? How did you actually come upon the job here? At WPAA. The job is not paid, so anybody willing to do it for free <laughs> probably could have gotten it. Um, actually, I was president of the League of Women Voters in New Haven in the 80s, and lady kept knocking on my door. She was a nurse. And there was a small core of advocates that were very interested in the movement of community television. The very first nonprofit community TV station was set up in 1986 in New Haven. It still serves New Haven. It serves West Haven, New Haven, and Hamden. It was a, I believe, four-year legal battle to enable them to establish this first nonprofit. By the time they actually got to the point of establishing the nonprofit, the, um, most of the people that were advocates were burnt out. In fact, this little nurse moved to North Dakota or something. She just needed headroom. Uh, and I ended up becoming a um, incorporator. I was one of the people that signed the papers to allow that nonprofit to come into existence because at that point so many people had gone and were burnt out. And so I kept involvement in community access no matter what community I was in after that. And um, because this community um, has such a rich and awkward story in history um, with community access, I decided that I wanted to prove that if it was done right, it could flourish. So thank you for asking. Yeah, how, how long have you been doing it? So I've been an active advocate of community TV for 30 years, but I've actually been full-time here keeping the doors open for six um, as of May. Um, almost seven days a week for six years and except for the fact that the seats are not full tonight um, I know that what we're doing is working and at least the peers in the industry think it's great because we won best in the US for our size um, this year so we have a lot to share with you folks um, come and be part of our story project and uh, is anyone interested in sharing a story besides the one you just heard? Does anyone feel up to doing a first story tonight?